Thank you for coming today. We've had a lot of good presentations and we got some more. Um, I'm not very good at giving speeches. I like to have a discussion. So, that's way too loud. Is it? Okay, good. I hate to blow anybody up. Might keep you awake, but okay. So, short presentation here about building relationships, working together to achieve a common goal. The applicator, the livestock producer, and the crop farmer. That's the way I distinguish it. Sometimes the generator and the crop farmer are the same person. Sometimes they're not. We, we run all different sizes of operations, so we see a little bit of everything. I'm out of Circleville, Ohio. I grew up as a farm boy. I have a degree in agronomy from ATI. Started WD Farms in 1987. One of my quotes, I'm, uh, my granddad and my great-granddad was all preachers, so I guess I get some of those genes. But one of my, I have lots of interesting points to ponder. And uh, one of my saying is, I'm not the cheap guy, I'm the best guy. So that's one of the philosophies we run off of. See if I can mess this up. Right side? Okay. So started the trucking business in 1985 as I retired from being a crop farmer. The early 80s was a great time to come out of college and start farming full time. So uh, I, got, I got tired of fighting with my dad. My dad's a great guy, but very intense as I am. And uh, I decided to go my own way. So I started a trucking company in 1985, hauling grain and fertilizer. In 1987, my cousin came to me and wanted to know if I could haul manure in that fertilizer tanker. I said, sure, I'll do anything for a dollar. So presently, we own four semis and six stainless steel double conical tanks. Uh, double conicals are probably our fourth or fifth generation of tankers. They're sloped to the middle. That way, everything has a tendency to run out. And we also have measuring sticks inside of them, so we know exactly that we're, it's calibrated stick that we're hauling at least 6,000 gallons, depending on the density of the product. We can go down to 55 or 5 if it's a water lime, 10 or 11 pound gallon, or sand based. We run JCBs. We work up to 200 miles from home. Unlike a lot of guys that say, well, we work within 20 miles of the house. I wish. 20 miles, most mornings, it's at least 45 or 50 or it's a hotel room. We work from Defiance to Hillsboro to out to Richmond, Indiana, and back to Circleville as our present area. Um, did a lot of municipal and industrial before 2005. In 2005, we came back to agriculture. We started to see some of the CAFOs go in and the opportunities. And again, not working very well uptown with some of the paper pushers, so I'd rather deal with a farmer than I would a, a paper pusher uptown. Um, JCBs, as prior everybody knows, 42 mile an hour on air brakes, a real good stable platform. And, uh, to do a lot of fast movement. Um, two years ago, we started a frack tank uh, drag line business. So it ties in again with our semis. Uh, we built this shop in our shop in less than a week. Um, they dropped it on a Saturday night, and the following Sunday night it came out of the shop ready to go to work. The motor on the back and the pump was something I used in, the, in a hog barn setup, and it was on a truck, and we pulled it off there and mounted it permanently. We use it to unload the semis into the frack tank. We have an 8-inch fitting on the front to hook into the drag line system. Um, sight gauges on the side so we know how full it is and, and keep, the, keep the flow running. Part of that drag line business, too, presently is we're running a 36-foot spray bar. Uh, a lot of our farmers are doing tillage in front of us and tillage behind us, so uh, it's not immediate incorporation, but uh, it's pretty short-coupled. It seems like it's especially on the dairy farms. Um, we're always putting a crop in or taking one off. Um, I don't presently do any hog manure with a, with a drag line. Um, that will change here in the next year. We've just signed a contract, and it, that will be immediate incorporation. Our rule of thumb is if it smells, we incorporate it, but I'm weird. I don't think dairy manure smells, so the neighbors might disagree with me, but not like hog or municipal, and we still do some municipal. Um, the pump in the bottom is a 375 horse deer with 8 inch lines. Uh, it's not too hard for us to achieve 2,000 gallons a minute two or three miles out with a series of pumps and hoses. Okay, so the, the, the meat of the speech, let's say. Now, one of, this is one of my sayings I've been saying for a long time. Manure application, if we've got the three people involved, the applicator, the livestock producer, and the crop farmer. It's got to be a sustainable operation for everybody at the end of the day, end of the year, 
so we can come back the next year. And it's got to be balanced, and everybody's got to win. And, and nobody can win big. Everybody just needs to win. That's, that's where we get in trouble. If somebody tries to be greedy or take advantage of somebody else, that's when we have problems. I quote a dairy farmer's friend of mine one day. He says, that's not too bad a price. I said, yeah, I'd rather bleed you for 20 than kill you in one. Not very politically correct, but it's true. It's, it's got to be, everybody's got to work together. So, you know, when I, this applies for this as well as when I'm interviewing an employee. What do you want out of life? What do you need? What do you want? You tell me what you want, and then I'll try hard to achieve, achieve those goals with you. So I've got to broke down here in three different categories. Under generator, the livestock producer. I use generator because, like I said, we do water plant lime, biosolids, a lot of different products, done paper mills, rendering plants. So dairy manure doesn't stink compared to a rendering plant, just FYI. So communication. You're seeing me say that about 12 times in the next 12 minutes. But talking, talking about problems or talking to tell me that you have a problem is the only way we're going to come up to a solution. If I don't know what your hot button is or that something is broke or there's a well hiding out there in those shrubs that I didn't know anything about, then we're going to have a problem. So communication, I say communication solves all problems because if we don't talk about it, we're not going to fix it. Biosecurity procedures. We work with several different gilt barns for two different uh, multipliers. They each have their own set of rules. At my place, they each have their own set of hoses. That's one way we help with the biosecurity. But, you know, tell me it's a secure place. Tell me what you want, and I'll give you what you need. Um, there's some di different written procedures. If it's a large farm, they probably have their own written policy, and they need to provide me with a copy of that. Agitation. What kind do you want? How much do you want? Who's responsible for it? Who do I call to put the curtains down in the hog barn? At what level do we quit agitating? Lots and lots of questions. Dairy lagoons, do I need a boat? Do I need two lagoon pumps? Or you could provide a pump, you could provide a tractor. All those things need to be done this month, not the 4th of May when the sun's shining and everybody's running 900 mile an hour and he's trying to chop hay and we're trying to haul, haul manure. Housekeeping. I think this is real important. I think it gives us a lot of work and helps us achieve our, our pricing. We run white trucks. We run stainless steel tankers that are clean. If we overload a stainless steel tanker, they are instructed to go find a garden hose and clean that tanker off before it goes down the road. One, we don't have the law enforcement chasing us for dripping on the road. People smell with their eyes, and if it looks clean, they assume the rest of the operation goes along with it. We even go to the point that I carry a box of kitchen trash bags in every truck. We hang a trash bag in the morning on the, at the job site. And whether it's our trash or somebody else's pop bottle, we pick it up and put it in that bag. Our goal is the place to be cleaner when we get home than it was when we came in in the morning. Hauler with a good reputation. That good reputation carries a lot. Um, so if you have a little boo-boo, they realize it's not a regular thing and you're trying your best not to, not to have a problem. Um, CLMs, we talked a lot about that today. Definition of CLM is somebody that hauls more than 25 million gallons. So technically, I'm the only one that has to be a CLM at my, at my location. All my tractor drivers, all my full-time employees are CLMs. They're one driving a tractor. They need to understand what a blowout is or water is the state or whatever the case may be. There's 235 CLMs. About 3% of those, that number is my operation. Some of them are no longer with me, but they would count in that number, and, I, and I've, most of my staff is a CLM. I pay them to go to the meeting, and I pay for all their fees. It's just, it's just the right thing to do, but a good reputation and being a quality, quality uh, hauler. Uniform application, documentation, the weather, the soil samples, the manure samples. We pull a composite manure sample every day on every job if it's got any size. If we move in and we only do 100,000 gallons, it probably doesn't have a sample if it's the first day or the last day of the operation. But if it's a regular run, we have a sample every day. So I also have a lot of data in my files and samples. And I have a good idea what that place is going to produce when I get there so I can match it to what the nutrient needs are. Um, we run time logs on things. All the trucks, we don't just make a check mark. 
we put a time stamp on when that load came away from the load stand. A big thing, especially on a hog barn, is no interference with day-to-day -day operations. Usually our footprint's smaller at a hog farm. No, don't be in front of the grain bin or the feed bins. Don't be in front of the loading chute. When's that truck coming in? Don't park, if it rains, don't park somewhere where they can't get access to what they need. So, you know, kind of want to, you know, do no harm. But you want to be invisible. As an applicator, you want to be invisible to the farm almost to where you come in and do your job and leave and, and there's no problems. You know, what roads do you want us to use? What driveways? What roads posted or, or has a problem we need to know about? You know, sometimes our jobs are 200 miles from home, and they said, well, here's the maps, but now I go to scout them, and it's got a bad bridge on it. Well, now I have to reassign things, and it might add miles and time to my operation, so therefore um, increases my cost. So good communication on that. Um, probably one of the things we have the toughest time of, of uh, my employees is coming back to driveway. You know, if a farmer doesn't want us to exceed 15 mile an hour, we need to have that discussion up front, and then I enforce it as much as possible. I have a 20-year-old son that's got a big foot, and I don't know where he got that genetics at, but, uh, you know, we're always in a hurry. We normally get paid by the gallon is the way we charge, and so whatever we can do to pick up the pace. And the next area here is concerns and kind of a, a catch-all. You know, neighbors, weekends, some places they don't let us work on weekends. When, um, and that's fine as long as we know that up front and I understand it and respect it. And again, Kevin talked earlier, just because the law says one thing doesn't mean you can't do more. You know, I got, I got fired from a place because I wouldn't haul on Saturday of Easter weekend beside town, beside the track meet. I said, I'm not doing it. It's not illegal. No, but it's wrong. And so I pulled out. And I, lo I lost that corn farmer as a customer. I still have the generator, but I lost the corn farmer. But... Um, Got to use common sense, and, and it's sometimes uh, my position. I have to be a coach to explain that to the, the generator and or the crop farmer. Um, tillage before and after and timing and who's going to do that. Again, good communications. And one thing I always ask when I leave is when you expect me back. So I already go ahead and put that schedule. We typically schedule six months to a year out in advance. Now, I've got room in my schedule lots of times for little stuff. But my regular customers, they know when I'm going to shoot to come back again next time, and I know what's going to be there when I get there. Okay, what I need is an applicator. Who, what, when, and where always makes a good mystery, I think, you know. So you want to get to those questions answered. How many gallons you got? Where are they at? Or where's the fields at? When are you going to be full? You know, I like to know when that drop dead deadline is. I work better under pressure. Uh, one of my favorite things, who's paying me? You know, we get a lot of, <laughs> I don't, I don't have much, tr farmers I like working with, we get, we get paid, we don't, ha we don't stress too often about, about getting paid. But you talk about those things up front. Um, a lot of our scenarios, uh, we'll get some money out of the generator and we might get, and we get some money out of the corn farmer. So, you know, we have that all divided up and agreed on ahead of time and not, not after the fact. Once I see the logistics of the job, I'll quote a price. And they know if I got a million gallons and I quote them two cents a gallon, they know exactly how much that money's going to be. And if I get close to that cap and we've got concerns, we, we communicate that instead of going over and then say, hell yeah, you owe me another $10,000. That's, that's a good way not to get invited back. Again, agitation. How much? What kind? Uh, we don't presently own a boat. Uh, we've run three different models of boats already. Um, we've pretty much settled on one we like, and uh, that's on my short list of, of purchases. But agitation uh, is huge importance, whether it's a hog barn and, and keeping capacity of that pit or in a lagoon. Uh, we've got good documentation that shows when we run an agitation boat, we bring the phosphorus up 30%. So now I have a more marketable commodity on the corn farmer side to help cover the cost, and we're keeping that lagoon at capacity so the inspectors don't have to worry how close we're pushing on the, on the full gauge. Big thing, too, is uh, contact information, phone numbers, addresses, all those things. Get that right up front so when you go to do not only to send a bill, but to send a copy of the application map and all the records and all the samples and all that stuff, I divide that stuff in the office, and I'll send a copy to the generator, and I'll send a copy to the corn farmer, crop farmer, right off the get-go. I won't. That way, everybody gets copies right to their office, and go from there. Yes, sir. Charge. 
Okay, the question is, how do I, I talk about being a marketable commodity and how do I access the charge? My rule of thumb, and it's just a rule of thumb, is NP and K, and today's commercial prices, and they were up there a little earlier, 30 cents, 40 cents, and 25 cents, or something like that for NP and K. Um, typical hog manure, you might be two cents a gallon, and uh, corn farmers should be willing to pay for half of NP and K. And one of my sales things is, I'm going to come up to you and I'm going to give you $20 today and I want you to give me 10 back. How many times do you want to do that today? All day, every day, right? Okay, but it's really actually better than that because you've got the micros, microbes, and organic matter depending on the manure. So it's more like I'm giving you 30 and I'm asking you to give me 10 back as a corn farmer. Now, the other thing is, and it's, it's covered here in a little bit, you know, do no harm. Put an even application out there on a the corn farmer's field don't compact it and don't piss off the neighbors. You know, you've got to bring something that has value. But our rule of thumb is 50. We've got customers working somewhere in that 50 to 75 percent range of NP and K. So, answer your question, I think. Um, expectations. I think this is probably one of the things that we all struggle with. Um, the corn farmers, the crop farmers that may not be used to manure, and they have, you know, they think it's like calling up the co-op and put my fertilizer on this afternoon because I want to plow tomorrow. Well, if it's a million gallons, it may or may not happen tomorrow, and especially if it's 12 miles from the barn. It, or a good day for us with the trucks and a honey wagon is about 250,000 gallons a day. So, you know, when do you want it? How long do you think I'm going to be there? We may cause a little bit of compaction where we pull the semis in off the road. If they're calling for rain, I'm not allowed to run. And if it's wet and you think you can shell corn, I can't haul manure because of AWC. So all those things, I need to do a better job of communicating with the crop farmer to understand what rules and regs. And I need a current copy of soil samples. That's the other one that, that presents a lot of challenges. So all those things, you know, need to make a list and go down to point by point with the crop farmer and or the generator to make sure that everybody understands what's got to be done to keep, and it's, it's not just satisfying the regulatory people, it's to do it right and make sure we got documentation that we did it right. Tillage, like I talked about before and after uh, application, um, we're doing a lot of vertical tillage in front of us. I like that. Uh, that does may not fit the no-till room here, and I understand that. But to make that sponge and break those cracks is, is vitally important to keep it out of the tile lines. Cropping schedule, like I talked about earlier. Uh, with the dairies now, they're chopped corn, they want to manure on day after tomorrow so they can put down rye or triticale or something to fit in their program. Um, so that, that has to be discussed and everybody on the same page. Uh, back to payment, prompt payment, um, um, probably somewhat unique. A lot of farmers are real good about writing checks, but all my bills say payment due in 10 days. And uh, that's strictly enforced. Now, if you want 20 and we talk about that up front, then that's okay. But it's, it goes back to good communication. Crop farmer needs, you know, back to my first part of the statement. What do you want? What do you need? Tell me. Even application it goes back to good agitation. You know, you want that first day to be the same numbers as that third day. I can get probably after the first 10%, up until the last 20%, I can make real good even application. It gets down to that last 20%, even with the boat, there's some challenges there. Um, if we recognize that, lots of times we'll pull that sample and we'll click it up a gear, drop our gallons per acre down a little bit, and try to keep that for farm field uniform left to right. And lots of times we'll start, if we run a field you know, every couple of years, if we always put it on this way, when I come back next year, I'll put it on this way and kind of try to even that field up. Again, no harm, be low maintenance. You know, the city, cities like me a lot. I come in, do my job, and leave, and they hardly ever see me. And uh, they told me that that's what they want out of a hauler. I think the corn farmers and the, and the generators feel the same way. Documentation, you know, again, all the records. You know, each piece of paper almost each day generates about five pieces of paper between the weather and application, the soil sample and the manure sample every day, every field. Again, timing. When's the next crop? Make sure that we, you know, they tell us that two or three weeks ahead of time, not when I pull in. It's like, well, I want to plant tomorrow and you're not here. 
uh, application window, same, you know, continuation of that. Housekeeping, the same, you know, keep the road clean, keep, don't drip. You know, use that incorporation equipment, no odors and no complaints. So, kind of summary, I'll beat my own drum here a little bit. Use a, use a CLM, use a certified, you know, you don't necessarily have to, but those people have enough interest to go through the time and trouble of being a CLM. And I think uh, the CLMs as a group are not the trouble, troubled uh, applicators out there. They're the ones following the rules and doing the right thing. So help yourself by hiring a CLM. Don't be afraid to ask for it. If you're a CAFO, you have to now have that number on your records. I haven't got mine memorized yet. I'm going to have to do that here. But, you know, CLM is a CLM for a reason. Just the same as the CCAs. There's a lot of CCAs in it. You went through the time and trouble to get that license because you saw value in it. And, and we need to be recognized for putting that value into that. About expectations. You know, mine, yours, and yours. We all got to be on the same page. We've got to. If we, we're on the same page when we start, we can be on the same page when we get done. Otherwise, somebody's going to be disappointed, and then that just makes bad feelings and, and, uh, and broken relationships. Written list of responsibilities, that's a little document here in the bottom corner. Um, I apologize for being small, but uh, it says equipment, calibrations, tile, blowout, soil cracks, soil saturations, insect monitoring, insect treatments, weather, soil samples, manure samples. And there's three people on there. There's the crop farmer, the generator, and the applicator. We initial each one of those boxes. The left side says inspections and the right side says records. And we run, we use this pretty hard again so everybody knows what we're supposed to be doing and who's responsible. And it goes, I'm not supposed to do that. And you go, you signed it. So I always said black and white beats, I think, every day of the week. So I, I documentation, I had city called me on the carpet one day and they tried to lay me out and I pulled the contract up and I Made it on the desk, and I said, don't think so, paragraph B, blah, blah, blah. Just, I was in the discussion. But, so, um, a written contract, and that's different than the written list of responsibilities. The contract for us is usually one or two pages. It talks about gallons anticipated for the year, um, who's to provide what, payment terms, and just, just the basics. It's, it's, it's probably not a legal document, but again, it's good black and white, and everybody agreed to it, and they signed off on it. it at least gives us an outline, a box that we're working with. Wow, last thing, good communication. I don't know how many times I've said that. If I said it 12 and 12, Glenn, pretty close. Um, and communication, I have a lot of 20-year-old employees, and I swear I told them that. And they said they heard it, but they didn't understand it. So that's a challenge to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, and you can't, you can't do it too much. And we have all this wonderful stuff now, texting and emails and cell phones where we're 24-7 or whatever, and yet I think some days our communication's worse now than it used to be. We're so busy, I'm so busy, I forget what I was told. So an email or a text, I can go back and look that up. So um, just, just talk, talk, talk. Um, the last thing, or ties in with that, is don't assume, and the phones work in both directions. If I haven't called you to say, when's your next time I need to haul manure, nothing says you can't call me and say, hey, I'm looking for you here in two weeks, or I'm going to get in about four or whatever. Again, the last thing you want to do is, um, can you haul manure? Well, sure, when? Uh, tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. Sure, it's going to cost you. And usually when they do that, it's raining. You know, so, okay, what's plan B? And, you know, they, they didn't get full overnight. I wish they could let me have put plan B in motion two weeks earlier that we wouldn't be rushed. But communication and respect and work together, and you can be successful on any one of those three parts of the legged